So we're going to start out with the concept of key value drivers. So using the key value driver equation, no plat times 1 minus growth over ROIC divided by WAC minus G. So here is a no plat, 100. Here is a WAC, 10%. Right? And then here are different growth rates, different Gs and different ROICs. Running them through that equation, we get this table. Okay? So it's just a table of results, putting those numbers for those different growth and ROICs through the key value driver equation. That would be the results. Okay? Then, on the next slide, enterprise value to EBIT. Okay? So here's the point. Let's assume a tax rate of 35% for simplicity. If I have 100 of no plat, then I'll have 154 of EBIT. Because EBIT times 1 minus the tax rate equals no plat. Therefore, no plat divided by 1 minus the tax rate would give us what the EBIT had to be. So I'm just solving for the EBIT of 154. Okay? So here's enterprise value to EBIT. The results of the key value driver formula divided by EBIT, that table is what you get. So these are the multiples of EV to EBIT. Okay? So here's the key. Definitionally, Bloomberg and most people, when they define enterprise value, what they're doing is what we would call operating value. So the definition in the real world for enterprise value is similar to what we would call operating value in our Medigliani Miller of Rearranged World. Therefore, when we calculate the key value drivers formula for ROIC, growth and free cash flow, and WAC, what we're actually calculating is what Bloomberg and others would call enterprise value. So enterprise value to EBIT, use the key value drivers, divide by EBIT, there you go. So here's the point. This divided by that equals that. So we have a data point, publicly traded data, and then we're working backwards to understand what drives key value drivers. Basically in the key value drivers equation, three things matter. Growth, return, cost of capital. So really what multiples are are a representation of growth and spread. That's multiples. Right? So here's the idea. Company, look at the table on this slide. Company trades at six times EBIT. Competitor trades at seven times EBIT. What can we tell that's different about those two companies from those two multiples? So we got a company at six, we got a company at seven. What do we know? Or what should we know? From this table. Yep. All right, let's focus on the higher return. Why do you know it has a higher return? So here's a seven, here's a seven, somewhere in here's a seven. So first point, when you see a multiple, it's actually a range. A multiple represents a range of growth and spreads. It doesn't represent one absolute number. So just as when we did the as is, we tried to figure out what is the range of growth and margin. With a multiple, we're kind of doing the same thing. What is the range of what the growth and spread could be? But in either case, given this data for the tax rate and the EBIT, we kind of know that it's relatively low growth, but it has a positive spread relative to cost of capital. What can we say about the six? Where do we see sixes on this table? Here's a six. Here's a six probably this way. So here's my sixes and here's my sevens. So what can we say about the six? It's going to be trades at six times EBIT in this industry. Yep. Not just a worse rate, negative spread. So here's what I'm telling you is hiding in plain sight is data about the spread of the companies going forward. Now very important 
it's not the current or historical spread. Multiples, since we're using forward multiples, are about expected spread in the future. So you can't just go look up the current ROIC of the company and say that's the, the trading multiple of the company. Maybe different, right? So multiples give us hints into spreads and growth rates. So in this case, we know the company trading at seven has a higher spread than the company trading at six for about similar growths. One's positive spread, the other's negative spread. Yeah. How do I know it's negative? Because I said the cost of capital is 10% on the previous slide. So 10% is the dividing range. Okay. And by the way, 10% would be a multiple of 6.5. So that's what's important for us to start to assimilate. Right? That's why, FYI, when you first learn how to do multiples in your first corporate finance classes, you learned it in what I would consider to be a very naive way. Right? You've got to start somewhere, but this is getting much more advanced. So what you say is, well, you know, everybody's going to eventually trade at an average multiple for an industry. No, it's not the case. Like, if you have an average multiple, then you have an average growth and an average spread. That's an average multiple. If you don't have an average growth and an average spread, then you don't trade at the average multiple. You'll trade at a discount or a premium based on your expected growth and your expected spread. And that's what will explain multiple differences across companies. So, <laughs> continuing on, the next multiple, EV to EBIT, EV to EBITDA, are relatively similar. Okay, But the next multiple is something called PE. So how do we get to PE? Well, again, key value drivers formula, except rather than using no plat, we use net income. Rather than using ROIC, we use expected ROE. Rather than using WAC, we just use cost of equity. And rather than using growth and free cash flow, we use growth and EPS. So that is the key value drivers formula to do market value of equity. So on the next slide, running the key value drivers formula with $100 of income, 10% cost of equity, growth in EPS, and expectation for ROE, here's the values. Those divided by 100, here's my PE multiples. So the same thing applies. What's the difference between a company with a PE of 11 and a company with a PE of 9? Okay, I'm asking you the exact same question. The company with a PE of 9 would have a negative spread. The company with a PE of 11 would have a positive spread if we were to do the key value drivers. Now, as I said, what we're generally going to do is we're going to work directionally because unless we pull out the formulas, at best, we're still going to get a range. But that's the insight that we will start to get. Now, to further help you do this, we go to the next multiple, and that's called price to book. It's also at the bottom of this page. So what would cause a company to have a price to book multiple of one? What does it mean to have a price to book of one? So I'm kind of the third multiple here. So what is price to book again? Yeah. So the, the shareholder's equity, the value, divided by the book value of equity are equal. So the market value and the book value are equal. So what would cause it to be equal? You're neither creating nor destroying value. Zero NPV. What causes that condition to happen? When do you get zero NPV? Yeah. When the discount rate is the same as the IRR. All right. So therefore, the IRR in this case is the return on equity, and the discount rate is the cost of equity. So back to spread. Spread of zero. So spread of zero is a price to book of one. So here's the beauty of the price to book multiple. Price to book multiple is the most elegant way of expressing expected spread. When the price to book multiple is one, your expected spread is zero. When the price to book multiple is above one, your expected spread is positive. When the price to book is below one, your expected spread is negative. All right. So let me give you an example. I work with a lot of banks. Banks have unique valuations, so we're not going to talk about it too much this semester. But here's the point. Let's go back to Bloomberg. And let's go to one of the largest banks in the world. Let's go to HSBC. 
So here's HSBC today. And let's go to our little RV template. And banks don't really have enterprise value multiples, so you're going to see some missing data points. But if we take our little template that we just created, just focus on price to book. HSBC's price to book is 0.64, which means they're trading at 64% of book value. Why? What do we know about HSBC from that one number? They have a negative expected spread. So then, let's go to their WAC. And their cost of equity, because it's based on equity, is 10.6% today. And then we go to the EEO screen. And the return on equity for HSBC for the next three years, 6%, 7%, 8%. So what I'm telling you is before I even went to the EEO screen, I knew what I was going to see. I was going to see a return on equity lower than their cost of equity because they're trading at 64% of book value. So that's what I mean by working backwards from the price to book. It's giving you data as we're starting to think about a company, but what the market's expecting going forward before you even actually do the math. And so this helps us as we understand the valuations and helps us understand what the market is thinking about the value. So one of the things I know about HSBC is the market's worried about their spread going forward, and that's why they're trading at a discount. So that's the good news for price to book. Here's the bad news for price to book. It's also the most susceptible ratio to being what I would call dirty and giving you misleading information. So I'm going to go to another company. Let's look at Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin, RV, custom, multiples. So here's the point. Their price to book multiple is 21.92. It's ridiculously high. Industries between 1 and 3, they're at 22. Right? Why would they be at 22? And the answer is accounting distortion. So Lockheed Martin's been around for over 50 years. It's Lockheed, etc. They got a lot of older workers who they also have a pension. And they fund their pension by funding the pension assets. Well, 2008, when the stock market collapsed, the value of their pension also collapsed. So what the accountants do is they write off the asset, because the market value went down, by writing off the equity to keep the balance sheet in balance. So 2008, 2009, Lockheed Martin had giant write-offs of equity because the pension assets went down. But subsequently, the market since 2008 has more than recovered to higher than pre-crisis levels. Well, the value of those pension assets has gone up dramatically. But the accounting rules do not let a company write up the value of the pension assets. So Lockheed Martin had its equity wiped out, but they can't mark to market the new high prices. So therefore, they have a distorted price to book. Yes? So how valuable is like the price of book ratio when you're considering to invest in the company? When it's dirty, terrible. When it's clean, good. <laughs> but here's the thing. <clears throat> how did I know it was going to be clean for HSBC? Because banks are allowed to mark to market the value of their assets. Traditional companies are not. Okay, So basically price to book is better for banks than it is for non-banks for that reason. So that's the point. What I'd have to do is I have to figure out whether companies have been doing lots of write-offs. And I can tell you from looking at this list which two companies look like they did a lot of write-offs historically. Lockheed's one of them. Who's the other one? Boeing. So that's the problem, is I can't use price to book, even though it's simple, because some of these companies did not do major write-offs, and they did. And it gets worse, because the write-offs that the accountants do sometimes don't even hit the income statement. They make direct write-offs to the balance sheet of equity. So we go to the next ratio. It's called the PEG ratio. PEG is the PE divided by the long-term growth rate. So what it says is, for a dollar or for a unit of growth, how much do I pay? Okay, so what would cause the peg to be higher? Why would I pay more than a dollar for a dollar of growth? Well, think about what went into the P-E ratio. It's the key value drivers. So it's profit, it's return, and it's growth. All right, sorry, it's sorry, return, it's growth, and it's risk, cost of capital divided by growth. So growth cancels out. 
So what you're kind of left with is spread. So it's growth and spread divided by growth. That's the peg ratio. So what does the peg ratio really tell you? Expected spread for the growth. So you have the PB that tells you the spread of the company, and you have the peg that tells you the expected spread of the growth. So these two should be similar, and if I use to break ties, this is what I mean by you have to look at kind of the tapestry of ratios to see when they're in sync, and when they're out of sync, you probably know you got some accounting issues going on, but when they're in sync, they should tell a similar story. So look at this data. Tell me, do you think Lockheed Martin has a positive spread? <coughs> yes or no? Does Lockheed Martin have a positive spread? Yes or no, and why? Because this is going to be your next homework assignment. Yes or no and why? Price to book? Does that give you the answer? Maybe, but it's distorted. <coughs> peg? Does that help with the answer? What does a peg of 1.91 tell you? What would a peg of one tell you? What would a peg below one tell you? Peg of one means that I basically pay a dollar for a dollar of earnings growth. Why would I pay a dollar for a dollar of earnings growth? Okay, so what does 1.91 tell you about Lockheed? So Lockheed Martin has a, a positive spread. So let's talk about growth rates. <clears throat> Look at the growth rate of the industry, if I recall on the right, 8.94%. Look at Lockheed Martin's growth rate, 8.62. Then look at the PEGs, and then look at the PEs. PE of Lockheed Martin is 16.48. PE of the industry is 14.9, 14.88. What can we say about Lockheed Martin's spread versus the industry spread? Is the industry spread positive? Who has the higher spread, Lockheed Martin or the industry and why? Lockheed does why? How do you trade at a higher PE if you have less growth? How do you trade at a higher PE if you have less growth? You have to have a higher spread. And how do we know Lockheed Martin has a higher spread that reinforces that? Because they have a higher peg. So this is what I mean by telling the story together that we're already seeing. Now we can get out the key value drivers and start plugging some numbers in, but at least at this point, this is I said, this is advanced. But at least you'll start to understand, like, why is Lockheed Martin trading at a premium, right? Because they have a higher expected spread for a slightly lower than industry average growth. Right? And that's why they're trading at a premium, right? Matter of fact, look at Raytheon. Raytheon's PE is 15.72. <clears throat> Who has a higher spread, Lockheed Martin or Raytheon? I'm sorry? Raytheon. Why? Because their peg's a little higher. They're similar, but a little bit higher. So similar to a little bit higher. Why is Raytheon not trading at a higher multiple for PE? It's growth and spread. So Lockheed Martin has the higher PE, and Raytheon has similar to higher spread, why would Lockheed Martin have the higher multiple? 
higher expected growth. Look at the best long-term growth rate, 8.6, 7.65. So this is what I'm saying. By putting these ratios together, the market's telling you a story. And you're just playing Sherlock Holmes, and you're figuring out the story. So be Benedict Cumberbatch. Figure this out. Right? Because that's what you need to do to help you as you do these models. Does that make sense? All right. So continuing on. <clears throat> so why enterprise value to EBIT versus PE? Given the choice, most professionals like enterprise value to EBIT over PE, right? And the reason is even though they tell you some more things, PE is more distortion prone. Why is PE going to be more distortion prone than EBIT, than enterprise value to EBIT? What can distort a PE? To give you a different answer, than enterprise value to EBIT. That's right. So think about the difference in EBIT and net income, and one of the things is interest, which is going to be influenced by capital structure. So if you have firms with two completely different capital structures, you're going to see a discrepancy between their EV to EBIT and their PE ratio. So if similar capital structures, then they'll be in sync. If different capital structures, they can be different. And so that's one of the things you got to recognize across ratios. What's another big distortable item between EBIT and net income? So one is capital structure. What's another one? Yep. One-time gains and losses, accounting tricks, and gimmicks. They will distort PE much more than they'll distort EBIT. So when a company has extraordinary gains and losses, when they have a bunch of non-operating gains and losses, when they have accounting adjustments, it will distort the P-E ratio. So as I said, just like price to book <clears throat> and PEG should tell you some more things, P-E and enterprise value to EBIT should tell you some more things. Unfortunately, those two things that we just mentioned lead to distortion. So even though people like P-E, because I think it's pretty intuitive for the average person to understand, it's actually the hardest multiple to explain because it's a six-factor model. There's six things that drive P.E. It's the four things that drive enterprise value, multiples, and then adding on the other two things, right? So specifically, it's ROIC, growth, and spread. And so therefore, you have to then explain on top of that taxes, which are part of NOPLAT. But then you got to look at differences in tax structure, differences in non-operating items, and differences in capital structure. So that's what I mean by comparables. If you have similar firms with similar tax structures and similar risks with similar uh, non-operating items, then it's easy. If you don't, it gets much more complicated. And so here is the formula for EV to EBIT. If you want to prospectively create one, here's the key value drivers formula rearranged to the EV to EBIT. And this is what I mean by it's a four-factor model. Because basically, EV to EBIT is going to be dependent on tax rate, growth, ROIC, WAC. So those are the four things that will cause differences in EV to EBIT across companies. So Pfizer is going to reincorporate using a tax inversion to Ireland. Eli Lilly is going to remain incorporated in the U.S., headquartered in Indianapolis. If everything about their business is the same, who trades at a higher multiple? Who's going to trade at a higher multiple, Lilly or Pfizer? And why? Yeah. Go ahead. Why would Lilly trade at the higher multiple? No. If you do the inversion, you actually get the lower tax rate. So you're right in the tax rate, just swap the companies. So Pfizer's going to Ireland to pay 10%, and Lilly's going to pay 35%. Yeah. So so that's, that's what you meant to say. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying is, this is inversion 101 is exactly right here. By doing an inversion, you save cash on taxes. By doing an inversion, you basically trade at a higher multiple, all things being equal. So is it worth it spending a couple million dollars for a tax accounting firm to come in here and change your PO box address with the IRS? Absolutely. Because if you can do that, then you will trade at a higher multiple, and you can run it through this equation and tell you exactly how much of a higher multiple you'll trade at. 
That's why these U.S. companies are abandoning the U.S. and going overseas and doing these aversions. It's the formula. It's the math. And this is the financial justification they make to their shareholders. We have to fix our tax code because this is really bad for the U.S. long term. But in any event, here's the final multiple I want to talk about, which is called EV to sales, EV to revenue. Again, start with key value drivers. Rearrange. You get this formula. So EV to... Enterprise value multiple, the key value drivers, get you this, this, get you that, that, this part is the formula for EV to EBIT. So enterprise value to sales equals margin times EV to EBIT. So here's the nice thing. If I take my EV to sales and I divide by the EV to EBIT, I get my estimated margin. So let's go back to Whole Foods. <coughs> So, WFM, U.S. Equity. So here are the calculated multiples using our templates for Whole Foods. Output Excel. Yes. So this is the outputted template for the multiples. Make it bigger. So here's what I'm going to do. Set a market cap. I don't care about the market cap column, so I'm going to say estimated margin. Equals enterprise value to sales for two years forward divided by enterprise value to EBIT for two years forward. That is the margin that the world is using today for these grocery store chains. Copy. This is the long-term margin that the market's using for Whole Foods. 5.2%. So, when we did the as-is valuation, this is EBIT, and that needs to be 5.2% because that's what the market's actually using. So this is what I told you a week ago was actually hiding in plain sight. I'm just telling you how to un unearth it. So I know that long term, somewhere around 5.2% is the margin that people are using based on the share prices that are trading today. So here's the point, 5.2. Sorry. To get to 5.2, I'm going to make this 8.1. And uh, can't change the white cells. <clears throat> and that gets me to a $34 share price. So, by the way, there you go. Now I'm close. As I said, I'll probably smooth out the margin enhancements. But if you really want to look at the as is, that's what the market's looking for. They're looking for growth of about 3% for Whole Foods. And they're looking for margins around 5.2 for Whole Foods. That's in the as is. Now, whether we agree with it and they're buy, sell, hold, that's okay. But as I said, you guys kind of used some logic earlier today to come up with this. And that's why I said, give me about 40 minutes and I'll give you my logic for the hold. Because I think that's the margins that the market's using. And then the question is, what do I think about their margins compared to their peers? Well, they're still trading at a premium to the industry. And for competitive reasons that everybody talked about, I don't see their margins going up over time. I actually see their margins stabilizing or going down from that point. Hence, I'm on the hold category. All right, so this is, reinforces the as is and reinforces what you're going to do for your analysis. So what you then need to do is you need to take this file, save it, and save it as a Excel model. And I'll call this the uh, multiples. And I will put this in the sorry, my security on my Excel has gotten to be extremely annoying. But I'm going to put it in my downloads folder 
as a uh, Excel template. And then I'm going to go back to our Whole Foods model and I'm going to add this as a final tab. So in our Excel model, you are going to put in a final tab called multiples. And that will be part of your homework for Wednesday that you're going to do. And it will be part of your group project that you're going to do. So put this in the downloads folder. Excel, call this uh, multiples. And then once it's saved, I want to put it into close out of all these. Take our model, open up the spreadsheet we just did called multiples, and then basically rename this worksheet multiples, right click, move or copy. I want to put it into my Whole Foods model. I want to move it to the end, hit OK, so that this is now part of my Whole Foods spreadsheet. That's what you're going to use for your next homework assignment. That's what you're going to use for your group project. So you will basically do this analysis in addition to the analysis you just did to help you with the baseline and to help you explain what's going on. The other difference is that you should be able to go through company by company and rank who has higher or lower spreads and growth rates relative to the peers and why people are trading at premiums or discounts. Right? So you need to be able to explain that. So why is Lockheed Martin trading at a premium to the rest of the industry? Right. Why is Raytheon trading at a premium, but less of a premium than Lockheed Martin? You should be able to explain that using the multiple analysis that we just talked about doing it directionally. That is your next homework assignment. So I'll pause here to ask for questions because I've given you enough information to do your next graded assignment. But if you have any questions, now's a good time to ask. Yes. Which one? The 3.8? So what I did, and I'm doing, I'm a bad analyst here. So what I did is I said, okay, if the EBIT gets down to 5.2, and I just kind of herky-jerky threw it from 5.5 to 5.2, okay, just very quick. Then when I did this to 5.2, this was a $34 share price. And I need to get, earlier today, Whole Foods was trading at 30.42. So I knew that in my ratios that I had already come up with a reasonable tax rate. I had already come up with a reasonable EBITDA margin that matched the analyst margin. So therefore, the only way I get back to 30 a share is I got to lower my growth rate. So 5, 4, 3. Again, I could go year by year, but that gets me really close. So what we did for the last homework is you just inferred what you thought the margin would be and what you thought the growth would be and you just reasoned it out. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm telling you is let's go a step further and let's actually use what the market is doing for margins and let's actually apply that. All right. So just as another quick example, let me go back to Lockheed Martin. So if I go back to Lockheed Martin, the defense and aerospace industry, on T. U.S. equity, and if I go back to Lockheed Martin and I go to our template here for multiples, output to Excel, then, and again, I'll make this bigger so it's easier to see, I know that the estimated margin that's being used in the defense and aerospace industry today, prospective margins, is around a little under 12%. And I know, based on the trading multiples, that Lockheed Martin's estimated margin is 12.2, Raytheon is 13.9. Hiding there in plain sight. So when Raytheon goes to the analyst and tells the analyst that we actually have better <laughs> margins than our peers, Raytheon has some of the best margins going forward in the industry.
right? But why with those better margins is Raytheon not trading at a higher multiple than Lockheed Martin? Well, what I can see very quickly, again, I'll make this a little bit smaller, is because for very similar spreads, even though Raytheon spreads probably a little bit higher, it's trading at lower multiples because Lockheed Martin is expected to grow that positive spread a little bit faster. So Raytheon and Lockheed Martin have similar spreads, a little bit, a little bit um, higher at uh, Raytheon than Lockheed Martin because they have better margins. But Lockheed Martin's growing faster. In fact, if I drill down to the first week of class, Lockheed Martin has more productivity. Raytheon has more margin. Lockheed Martin is more efficient with their use of the balance sheet. They have faster cycle times. And that faster cycle time and higher growth rate is why Lockheed Martin is trading at a premium in the industry. All right, so it's not just about the margins. And by the way, I can make every single one of those statements. I know I'm right. And I haven't seen a single financial statement. I haven't looked at an income statement. I haven't looked at a balance sheet. It's right here in the multiples. Okay, so <clears throat> got a couple more minutes left. Let's pick another industry. Give me any other industry. <coughs> company or industry? Yeah. Who? Internet. Who? Give me a company. Pick a company. Okay, so let's look at PayPal. Let's look at the payment space. PayPal. So here's PayPal, and here are their payment peers. Okay, so basically what I could do, again, same thing, settings, output, Excel. Again, estimated margin equals enterprise value to sales divided by enterprise value to EBIT. That is the margin that the market is using today for PayPal's industry, payment industry, and for PayPal itself, 21.6. So PayPal has below average margins compared to their payment peers. Now what's interesting is PayPal relative to the industry group that it's in. Again, their price to book multiple is lower. Maybe that's distorted. Their peg is lower, which suggests a lower ROIC. Their growth is higher. And PayPal is trading at a discount to enterprise value to EBITDA and enterprise value to EBIT. But due to PE, which is based on cap structure, differences and non-operating differences, they traded a similar PE. But what could be happening is PayPal could be levered up and some of these other firms could be all equity. All right, I don't know, but that would be one thing I'd want to investigate as I looked across the firms. All right, but what I do know is PayPal is a lower margin firm and PayPal is expected to grow faster than the industry. So that's actually why they're, they're trading at a little bit of premium to the enterprise value multiples because the market is valuing their growth more so than their margins. Right? And that's what I'm telling you is very quickly, you're going to start through practice to look at this data and gain tremendous insight that a lot of other people don't know how to do. And I'm telling you, this is advanced. Right? This is not basic. Right? They don't teach you this in other, other classes. Right? But if you understand this, it'll help you really start to be able to explain these multiples and why companies trade where they trade. And by the way, here's another reason why what you've learned before works against you. And I'll show you this final thing as we talk about this. Let's say we're doing Google, which is Alphabet. So again, I'll go to Bloomberg. And let me just look at Google real quick. So I go to Google. And the first thing I look at is what is their growth rate. And I'll use growth and sales as a proxy. But here's the problem we would have with traditional multiples analysis for Google. Right? right now, Google's 2016 and their current multiple is around 21 and a half. Right? So here's what a typical naive analyst would do. They'll say, okay, Google grows $1 of earnings per share. Their multiple is 21 and a half. Therefore, their stock price will go up $21.50. And that's how I'll set my target stock price. And if Google grows another 
dollar the next year, they'll go up another $21. So if they give me $2 of earnings growth in the next two years, their stock price will go up $42 because Google will trade at a 21 times multiple times earnings, and that's the price. Right? Here's why that's naive. Law of large numbers. As Google gets bigger, it's harder to maintain the same growth rates. Look at what happens to their growth rates as they get bigger. So here's the thing. If multiples are a function of growth and return, growth and spread, then as the growth rate comes down, the multiple comes down. So in two years, $2 of earnings growth are not multiplied by 21 and a half. They're multiplied by 18.4 because if you run through the key value drivers, a lower expected growth rate at that time leads to a lower multiple at that time. So they don't trade at the same multiple that they trade at today into the future. And that's how I can misprice Google because I'll assume that they'll trade on future earnings at 21 and a half. But that's naive because when they get bigger, they're not going to maintain their growth rate. And at a lower growth rate, they'll have a different multiple. That's why finding comparables is so important. It doesn't mean that Apple is bad because Apple trades. And again, look here at the RV screen. It doesn't mean that Apple is bad because Apple is trading at a PE of PE of 11 and Google's trading at a PE of 18.4, what it means is they have different levels of growth and spread. Apple is not growing and with no growth, this great return gets them a PE of 11. So again, if I switched here to Apple, and I look at their EEO, Apple is not expected to, they're actually expected to shrink next year and then single, low single digit growth. Well, that's a different PE when you run it through our formula than a company that's growing at 10 to 15% a year. So that's what I'm telling you is that when they talk about comparables, this is why it's harder to make Apple and Google truly comparable because as the growth rates are different, the multiples will be different. So you can't say that Apple's undervalued because Apple trades at 11 times earnings and therefore should trade at 16. That's a naive statement. Why would Apple trade at 16? What would have to happen to Apple? What would have to happen to Apple to trade at 16 times earnings? Yeah. Exactly. They'd need growth rate approaching 10 to 12%. Then they'll trade at the same multiple as Google. So that's what I'm saying. Like an analyst will say, gee, Apple's undervalued because Apple, you can buy 11, Apple for 11, Google's at 16, and Apple should be trading at 16 because Google trades at 16. And when these two companies are mixed together, then therefore you're going to get a deal on Apple. No, that's not the way it's going to work. The reason Google's going to eventually trade at 16 is because Google's growth is going to slow to 10%. Apple's never going to get to 10% anytime soon unless something major happens that is unexpected in the marketplace as a $220 billion company. So therefore, they really won't have the same multiples. And Apple may actually be very fairly priced, not underpriced when people look at multiples. And I want you to understand every single word that I just said and be able to repeat that. That will be a good chunk of your final exam. When I talk about your final exam, this is going to be heavily explained on a final exam. I'll give you data. You're just going to write out stories. 